All right, we're back. So let's talk about the body keeps the score. And uh, first chapter here is a continuation of talking about the brain. Let's see. All right, so I thought I thought the whole uh, discussion of Darwin was pretty interesting because you know everybody thinks about Darwin's uh, you know book on uh, evolution and species, but uh, but I was unaware of this uh, this other book, and it seems seems pretty on target, um, and. Uh, you know, the expression of emotions. And, um, you know, I think uh, in Man and Animals, and it, it was really a forerunner to a lot of uh, a lot of this other theories. I just don't think they had, um, you know, uh, quite of advanced uh, understanding or technology to uh, kind of prove a lot of this theories. But it, it turned out that, uh, you know, his... Uh, a lot of it, a lot of it was uh, proven later, but um, so uh, I like it also that he started giving um, the etymology of some of the terms. So etymology, the the origin of the the language. So emotions from the Latin emovere. Uh, to move out. Uh, so um, I'm just going to share some of the things that I thought were pertinent and maybe share a few stories. Um, so, you know, Darwin thought uh, the purpose of emotions is to initiate movement. So, you know, we have, we have the etymology to move out, but movement that will restore an organism to safety and physical equilibrium. So here's his comment on the origin of what today would be called PTSD. Prolonged escape or avoidance behavior would put the animal at a disadvantage in that successful species Preservation demands reproduction, which in turn depends upon feeding, shelter, mating activities, all of which are reciprocals of avoidance and escape. So um, if an organism, including human beings, are stuck in survival mode all the time, uh, you know, they're they're not experiencing the flip side of that those emotions um it's really more like uh they're stuck its energies are focused on fighting off unseen enemies which leaves no room for nurture caring or love um so you've got to have both of these so you know when we're talking about uh fight or flight that aspect of a response, uh, if we're unable to shut those that response off after a trauma, we're always going to be hyper vigilant, and we're not going to be able to form uh, relationships of built on trust, love, and reciprocity. Um. So, uh, you know, I think that um, when we're talking about uh, basically, um, the anatomic nervous system, uh, you know, we have the sympathetic, which acts as the body's accelerator and the parasympathetic, which serves as its brake. Um, so we're talking about, you know, the nervous system and the, uh, how it kicks in when we need to respond immediately to a threat. Um, but the parasympathetic also, you know, says, hey, okay, we're safe. The threat is gone. And that's the missing part with somebody who's experienced a lot of trauma. So we can't go back 
to a calm state where we can move on and basically enjoy relationship with other. Um, let's see. Uh, so then he talks about, so the sympathetic nervous system responsible for arousal, including fight or flight, escape or avoidance. Uh, 2000 years ago, the Ro Roman physician Galen gave it the name sympathetic because he observed that it functioned with the emotions, sympathos. So with emotion, pathos is emotion, sim is with, um, and, uh, you know, uh, para means against. So para uh, sympathetic would be against emotion. Um, and uh, just looking for things you might need to remember here. Um, HRV just stands for heart rate variability, um, which would be, you know, our physical reaction to threat. And then he really goes into uh, Porges' theory a lot more than the textbook does, and I like his I like his explanation of it. Um, made us look beyond the effects of fight or flight, and put social relationships front and center of our understanding of trauma, suggesting some new approaches to healing. So. There's a couple things I found interesting about this. So uh, a lot of times people who have experienced addiction, trauma, or like the veterans who experienced war, um, you know, they'll find safety and healing in a group. Um, so some find comforts in groups where they can replay the traumatic experience could be rape torture combat um abuse uh with others who have had similar backgrounds or experiences but focusing on a shared history of trauma and victimization alleviates their searing sense of isolation that's a good thing so universality however uh, usually at the price of having to deny their individual differences or their individuality. Members can belong only if they conform to the common code. That's why when uh, the author was uh, leading these groups with veterans, the only way he could truly be accepted and trusted is if they made him part of the group. That's why they gave him a military watch for Christmas. Um, so well-functioning people are able to accept individual differences and acknowledge the humanity of others. So there's a healthy part of a victim's group experience or trauma group experience, but there may also be an unhealthy part to that. Um, so they talked about uh, coining the word neuroception and the textbook talked about that also, the capacity to alleviate relative uh, danger and safety in one's, evaluate relative danger and safety in the environment. So there are three uh, basically uh, reactions to a crisis so, or trauma. So there's social engagement, fight or flight, uh, freezing. Um, and he gave, he gave the example of, uh, so three stages. So first, we, we cry for help. We want somebody to help us in that situation. If no help, so that's social engagement, we call for help. If the nobody comes, then we either fight or flee. Or if that is not working, our last resort is freezing. So there is a, a slightly different part of the brain that uh, moves from fight or flight to freezing. 
And the part of our brain that freezes is the most primitive part, what they call the reptilian part. He gives the example of, uh, you know, if you go into a pet store and you see the uh, guinea pigs and kittens and everything else, um, if they get tired or if somebody's teasing them, they'll all huddle together uh, and crawl on each other for protection and safety. But if you go into the reptile section of the pet store, they're curled up in a corner, very still uh, in reaction to all of the people who are looking at them. He drew a picture of the ventral vagal complex, talks about a little more. I, he's got some good illustrations. Our textbook should have that too. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so he talks about that, but he also talks about the DVC, the dorsal vagal complex, um, and uh, it it regulates our heartbeat uh, so we can go back to normal. Um, so they gave the he gave the a study of uh, individuals who experienced a plane crash. Uh, and, um, some people, uh, you know, are panicking and some people are frozen and they shut down, but he also gave a group of a third group of individuals that he didn't expand upon. And that group of individuals remained calm and helped everybody off the fiery plane. So. He didn't talk about that third group. We've talked about fight or flight. And we've also talked about freezing. Uh, but I always found it interesting that um, there, there is a group of people. And like uh, a lot of times it is first responders. And I work with a lot of them and uh, with the Red Cross. And I experience it myself. Um, so it's not, I don't know how to explain it. I like helping other people. So I don't like, you know, shootings or crises. It's a horrible thing, but I do want to help people, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, emotionally uh, when they've experienced something like that. But when I go to a scene, where there's been, I don't know, a horrific fire or um, the building collapses, or if I go to a scene right after a shooting, um, it's fairly chaotic. But my friend and I, who work with the Red Cross, um, we seem to be able to be very calm amidst the chaos everybody's running around and there may still be some panic depending on how quickly i can get there but um i'm calmer than in my normal life in my normal life i'm a little anxious but in a crisis i'm completely calm and then when i leave the scene and i'm sitting at home reflecting that's when i experience anxiety um and I think the reason for that is that um, at the end uh, of the second chapter that we read in this book, he talks about um, the need for mindfulness. And uh, it's something that I've tuned into all of my life, um, not on purpose, uh, but I was always experiencing a little bit of anxiety, like it's not diagnosable or anything, but I, uh, it's, it was hard for me to just be calm on a daily basis, just feel relaxed. So I found different activities helped me to relax, but they aren't normal activities. Um, so I was an archery instructor and um, I competed in uh, long range shooting 
and uh, I was uh, a runner, but all of those activities, um, if I was aiming uh, an arrow at a target, I was only thinking about the bow, the arrow, and the target. I was completely focused in the present. And it it's a very calming experience because I'm not thinking about my past. I'm not thinking about the future. I'm only being present in the now. That's where my focus is. And so when I'm able to be present in that moment, that's when I feel calm. I think that's when everybody feels a sense of calmness, but they do it different ways. Some people do yoga or meditation or other things. It's whatever works for you. But I think it, when I when I go to a scene of tragedy and chaos, I think that brings me into focus, into the present. And I'm able to navigate that in a calm way um, because I have a purpose. And uh, and it's only when I'm sitting doing nothing that I I start thinking and ruminating on, oh, maybe I should have done something different. What do I have to do next? Um, so, you know, one of the things that people who experience trauma do not have is mindfulness in the present, um, an awareness of everything that is occurring in the present. Um, they might be hyper vigilant because they feel unsafe, but that's a little different than being mindful. Uh, on a daily basis, so, you know, Zen Buddhism would call it a prayerful act. Um, so reminding ourselves to pay attention and to experience fully whatever our current action is. So if we're, you know, cooking a meal, experience the joy of cooking that meal. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of saying like, uh, you know, what was the secret ingredient love, you know, in that meal, uh, and, uh, but it could be any daily activity. Uh, if we are focused on that experience, uh, everything can become an art. They have the art of serving and making tea, you know, it could be anything. Um, let's see. So one of, one of the things they talk about new approaches to treatment. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that he mentioned was how a colleague of his, uh, used to incorporate play with kids who had experienced trauma. He gave example of a beach ball that he would carry around if the kid was not in a good mood that day. And uh, he didn't talk about it yet. Maybe he will in a future chapter, but that's why I think play therapy is so effective with younger children. Um, it's not just a diversion, though. It's actually working through experiences through play and perhaps they never actually had somebody sit with them in the present and in a non-judgmental and totally accepting way and allow them to play to act out anything they wanted and uh you know he did at the end of that chapter five he did talk about how a lot of times schools miss the mark on this and how relationship becomes so important. And if kids are acting out in class, there's probably a reason. And not to do away with things like recess or fun activities. I couldn't believe it when I sent my daughter to like first grade and like they cut out all these recesses. Like when I was younger, we had like 
lunch and three recesses and some type of fun experience and you know uh and they expect them to just sit in a seat most of the day um and uh you know but so when i was a school counselor um uh, you know teachers would reach the end of their rope and instead of sending the child to uh, the office, they would send them to me. They didn't want to bother the principal, so they sent them to me. And uh, so I would be calm and talk to the child about anything they wanted to talk about. I was not a disciplinarian. Oftentimes, I didn't even talk with them about the bad behavior. I just talked with them about their lives and uh, why they were angry or upset what was the feeling beneath that anger what happened earlier uh, that might have added to their uh, emotions or their emotional reactions to something little in the classroom and oftentimes i would just find out that you know uh the a single parent would have to go to work early. And even though they were just in elementary school, they were responsible for getting breakfast and getting two other younger siblings dressed and getting them on the bus as well. And, uh, you know, the same thing uh, because they would get home before that parent would get home uh, from work, especially if they had to work late. And uh, so they were really taking on a lot of responsibilities at a very early age and the younger siblings probably were acting out themselves and they come to school and they wouldn't have their homework done and that would make them anxious because they knew they'd get in trouble and uh, they might lose recess and they there weren't too many recesses so you know my take on that is that it was amazing that they even made it to school and we're doing as well as they were. And uh, I would say that to them. And I couldn't tell the teacher everything that was happening in their lives, but I could tell them that, you know, kind of reframe their perspective that they were actually doing really well based on their circumstances. And, uh, you know, um, it's difficult when an authority figure doesn't understand the whole picture. And, uh, you know, so sometimes, you know, schools kind of lose, lose the mark there. Um, if you look at Finland school, uh, schooling, uh, there is no homework. Um, there, uh, there's plenty of experiential activities and, uh, most of it's, you know, every subject has some type of experiential activity. And, you know, there's no worksheets. There's a lot of communication and dialogue and groups. And uh... all right. So the next chapter, um, that's when he talks about the woman who experienced uh, trauma uh, with uh being kidnapped and raped and did not have a positive upbringing with a parent who had a lot of different um, foster children in and out of the house and uh, maybe didn't really appreciate her own child. Um, and she was picking a lot at her skin and it would bleed. And, um, uh, you know, he makes, he, he talks about, um, he says, in my experience, patients who cut themselves or pick at their skin like Sherry are seldom suicidal, but are trying to make themselves feel better in the only way they know how. So I started working with a lot of young people who either had some form of an eating disorder and then, so that was like, uh, first 10 years. And then after that, there was a lot more cutting happening. Do I need to read that note? All right. 
So, you know, when I was in middle school, the teacher would grab a note and then they, if you were passing a note and they'd read it in front of the classroom. And I knew she did that. And so I wrote something down and I pretended to pass it to the person next to me and she grabbed it and said, open it up, ready to read it to the whole classroom. You know, it was always like, you know, somebody wanting to date somebody, but I'm like, Mrs. Metcalf, I hope you have a great day. So, yeah. All right. Um, anyway, cutting. So it started out, I would get a lot of cases with eating disorders of various kinds. And uh, then it moved on to more young clients who were cutting. And uh, after getting a lot of supervision, on how to treat uh, these individuals, a lot, of, a lot of the traditional methods were not working for them. Um, and I had also worked with a lot of addictions and I noticed a similarity between individuals who were cutting and individuals who were experiencing addiction. And if you think about it, um, a lot of individuals experience trauma and want to self-medicate. Uh, and so it used to be they would drink alcohol and become alcoholics. Um, and then later, uh, you know, depending on whatever was popular, that's the drug they would use. It ended up being pills mainly at the end. But, uh, you know, so there's a whole class on addiction, but... There is an addiction curve. So uh, people who are trying to quit whatever they're addicted to, it's very difficult because maybe they're at the bottom level of that curve and everything's fine and they're calm and they don't want to take a drink or use a drug. But then all of these things in life begins to happen or they haven't resolved whatever trauma or abuse they experienced and they begin to think about it. And then things in life start stressing them out. And then they become self-critical or upset and, and their anxiety begins to build. And as the anxiety gets about halfway up that curve, they wanna relieve their anxiety and they're not sure how to. And they know that whatever drug or drink they were using made them feel better for at least a little while because it changed the chemicals in their brain. And, uh, you know, and so that's the first thought I could use, I could drink. And as soon as that thought appears, it becomes an option that they don't want to do. And so they resist it at first, but the anxiety keeps building. And the next step is there's usually a ritual involved with an addiction. It might be going to your favorite bar, it might be buying a six pack and drinking it in the garage. Uh, you know, it might be uh, scoring some heroin, going through the, you know, uh, putting it in a teaspoon, putting some water in it, using a, a lighter uh, to dissolve and heat, uh, tapping a needle, you know, there's a whole ritual involved. Even smoking cigarettes, uh, Americans tend to hit their pack of cigarettes against their palm to pack the tobacco tighter. They think it gives them more nicotine. Americans don't know what's going on because Europeans do it the opposite. They'll pull out a cigarette and they'll twist it to loosen the tobacco because if the tobacco is looser, there's more oxygen as the cigarette burns. So it burns at a much faster rate. So they get a much better hit of nicotine, but that's part of the ritual. They'll go down to their, their normal store. They'll, they'll order their favorite brand of cigarettes. They'll hit it against their, uh, palm, they'll unwrap it, they'll pull out a Zippo lighter, even the sound a Zippo makes, uh, the little cling 
and uh, the smell of the lighter fluid. And then they put the cigarette in their mouth and they light it. So when they begin thinking about the ritual, there's no turning back. It might as well be done because br your brain's already getting ready for that. If you begin to think about the ritual process, chemicals are beginning to change and your brain is preparing for whatever drug you're going to use. And then they use, and then you go all the way back down that curve and you bottom out again. So think about cutting. Somebody's experiencing a lot of anxiety or emotional pain either because of abuse or uh, personal issues or trauma or whatever it might be. And they don't like feeling that way. And at some point, either somebody shared with them that they cut or they experienced some type of accident. You know, maybe they cut their finger with a kitchen knife by accident, uh, but somehow they experienced a minor injury and um, they, first, we experience pain when we're injured, and our mind moves into the present moment, and we're no longer thinking about all of those other issues in our lives. We're only thinking about reacting to the pain. And then our brain produces its own chemicals, uh, cortisone and everything else, to react to that pain. And first, our brain wants to think, oh, we need to not cause any more pain. We don't want to continue the injury. So we have an automatic reflex action. We look at it. We're drawn into the present so that we can react and prevent any future harm. And then our brain chemicals begin to produce some type of reaction to that pain. Uh, and it begins to feel a little better. And then we go wash it off, put some peroxide on it, maybe some neosporin. That really takes away the pain, a bandage. It's like it never happened. And then they realize, wow, I feel better emotionally. I'm not thinking about all of that other junk that was causing me emotional pain. Physical pain overrode emotional pain. And I got a little weird chemical reaction in my brain too. And so they know it is not socially acceptable to cut. So they'll usually, you know, get a razor, uh, you know, from a shaving razor or a little pocket knife or something like that. And, uh, they're not going to leave that sitting on their dresser for parent to see. So they'll usually put it in a box that means something to them and put it under the bed or in a drawer. There's probably some other keepsakes in that box that mean something to them so that every time they begin that cycle of addiction, of anxiety, and it, all the uh, life things happen and they start thinking about negative things or things that have happened to them and they start going up that addiction cycle and then they think about cutting themselves and they know that box with the knife or the razor under their bed is waiting for them and once they begin thinking about the ritual process all they have to do is wait for a time when nobody's paying attention to them, they shut their door, grab the box, start looking at some other meaningful things that are in the box that they might find some comfort in and, uh, and go through that. They follow through with ritual and then cutting, and then they experience that chemical and physical reaction, and they're back at the bottom of that curve again. So that's the similarity between cutting and addiction. And we're actually producing our own physical and emotional reaction.
uh, throughout that process. Um, so it becomes a coping mechanism, uh, just like any other self-medicating addiction becomes a coping mechanism. Anyway, that's my thoughts on cutting. Um, and then he gets into this thing, you know, how do we know we're alive and the concept of self and uh, that even the concept of self is, you know, uh, part of the brain. And uh, so, you know, there's there's a number of different parts to identifying with a concept of self. Um, you know, there's our physical uh, feelings and being able to identify with our own body, which is often not functioning properly after a trauma. There's also uh, the concept of our place in time, our place in reality. Often we can detach from ourselves and look at ourselves. Um, there's, uh, you know, our cognitive self-perception, which can often be negative. Uh, and um, the conversation we have with ourselves. Not everybody has a conversation with themselves. Some people do not talk to themselves, but the vast majority of people have conversations in their minds. Um, so the interesting side note is that there are certain illicit drugs where people kind of have a bad trip because it changes these parts of our brain and we lose a concept of time or self and people are not comfortable with that, but they're kind of stuck for a while on that drug. So there's kind of trapped in this limbo of no self or no different perception of time. So that sense of feeling trapped with no way out creates paranoia, which leads to anxiety, which leads to a bad trip and, you know. Um, oh, and I was talking about the dendrites uh, firing. So, uh, you know, if people use certain drugs like marijuana, you know, it really creates a lot of misfires in dendrites. And so when you have a dendrite misfiring, it connects with the wrong dendrites. And that's why everything seems so connected and creative. Uh, creative. That's why people have such supposedly creative thoughts. Uh, it's, it's all dendrite misfiring. Um, all right. They talk about this concept of being fully alive and living in the present and mindful acts and mindfulness. Um, so the second part of mindfulness is not only us being in the present, but it's kind of existential. It's kind of like Martin Buber's book, I and Thou, because being mindful is not only about our own experience, but it's about an experience of other. And this is where this book kind of crosses over to relational theory in the textbook. And uh, so to be, to be mindful is not only to be mindful of ourselves, it's also to be mindful and to be present with other to fully experience other in relationship, whatever type of relationship that is. And I think this is pretty valid for counselors too, to be present for your client, not to be thinking about happen before the session or after the session, to, but, but to be present with that client. And, uh, and then counseling becomes a mindful experience. And some of the examples they give of working with different clients, they'll talk about um, 
how meaningful the counseling experience was with that client, not just for the client, but for the counselor as well. They have uh, a little blurb on panic attacks and, you know, people experiencing anxiety that lead to panic attacks. It usually doesn't start off with panic attacks. It can start off with a phobia, like not wanting to go into crowds or germs or something like that. But if it gets bad enough to lead to a panic attack, people then who experience a panic attack have shortness of breath, they have rapid heartbeat, it feels as if they're going to die until they either pass out or calm down, and then they feel normal again. But then the fear shifts from the phobia, and it becomes a fear of panic attacks, because they never want to experience that again. So, But if they think that they're experiencing enough anxiety that they might experience a panic attack, it heightens the anxiety even more, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, then they do experience a panic attack. So it becomes a cycle. And uh, flooding actually works best for that, but you know, you gotta have a physician, and you know, you don't want somebody to have a heart attack, and you know. Um, but they have to realize that a panic attack in most instances will not result in death unless they have another physical ailment. So one thing I liked was the most natural way for human beings to calm themselves when they are upset is by clinging to another person. This means that patients who have been physically or sexually violated face a dilemma. They desperately crave touch while simultaneously being terrified of body contact. I like the case they talked about with the person who was picking at their skin and hurting themselves and how he didn't feel as though he was connecting with that client. And so he recommended massage therapy, just experiencing human touch in a safe and therapeutic environment. Um, and that kind of changed everything. So, all right, any comments? Any questions on this? It's nine o'clock. I'll put up the discussion board tomorrow and I will see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. It was good.